The, the part of the chapter I want to focus in on today for this morning's sermon is that, that latter portion um, with this whole parable about the servant and, you know, this guy owed a lot of money unto his, unto his Lord or unto his master and his master was going to sell. He's like, okay, well, I'm going to have to, you're going to have to come into bondage, you and your family, and you're going to have to pay this whole thing off. And, and um, basically the Lord showed, showed mercy on him. He, was, he forgave him. He's okay, I'm going to forgive you this debt. And it was a lot of money that he owed him. So then the same guy that just was forgiven, you know, he goes out and someone else owed him a much, much, much smaller amount of money, right? And, um, and he showed no mercy on him. Like he just got forgiven this huge debt that he owed. And this guy owed him a bunch of money or a little bit of money. And he's like, no, you know, he grabs him by the throat. He's like, pay me that thou owest. And... He doesn't, you know, the same, it's like the same situation. It gets flip-flopped. And the guy's like, you know, I'll pay you, I'll, you know, just have mercy on me. You know, I'll, 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 I'll pay you everything that's owe you. Just give me a little bit more time or whatever. And he's saying no. And he casts him into prison until he's able to pay the whole thing. So when, uh, the, you know, the Lord's servants hear about everything this guy just did, they're like, this guy just got forgiven. Now he's exacting, you know, he's doing the exact opposite of what he ought to be doing. And so that's when the Lord comes and he's like, you know, you wicked servant. He said, I forgave you all that debt in verse 32, because thou desirest me, shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Now, I want to expound this. The, the message this morning is going to be explaining this because this is something that people can get confused on. And just recently out soul winning, I had someone ask me about this because people who believe in a works-based salvation or that you have to obey the law or you have to do other things to be saved other than just put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ will bring up verses like this. And, and this can be difficult maybe for some people to understand. And when you see this, we say, well, wait a minute, I thought I was already forgiven. Right? Jesus Christ paid for my sins. When I put my faith in him, I'm already forgiven. Right? So why is this saying that I have to forgive others in order to be forgiven? Just like in Matthew chapter 6, you could, you could keep your finger here if you want. We're going to come right back to this. I'm going to go a little bit more in depth into that parable, into that story. But in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 12, we start, we're going to jump halfway into the, uh, the Lord's Prayer. And he says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors as part of the Lord's prayer. He's, you know, he's saying, you know, God, forgive us what we owe, the debts that we owe, even as we're forgiving, you know, people who owe us as part of the prayer. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Look at verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses... Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So people will point to that. I've heard people, especially Catholics, other people will say, you know, this, you have to forgive other people or else God's not going to forgive you. And the way that they take that to mean is that, well, if you don't forgive other people, then you're going to go to hell. That is a works-based salvation. That is not true. But what it is, it's not a proper understanding of forgiveness. And basically what I'm preaching on is there's two types of forgiveness taught in the Bible. And um, I'll read this for you too from Mark 11. It's basically a parallel passage for Matthew 6. And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive... Neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. So we see this in multiple places, this, this concept of you need to be able to forgive other people or else God's not going to forgive you, right? Now, let's go, let's dig into Matthew 18 a little bit deeper. Let's look, try looking at this in the context of does this apply to our eternal salvation, to the salvation of our souls, right? Because we have hundreds of verses that tell us, you know, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know, for whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Over and over and over and over and over again throughout the Bible, you're going to see the requirement for salvation is put your faith in Jesus Christ, right? So 
let's look at this and try to see if this will line up at all in context of eternal life, of, rece of receiving salvation. So it starts off, he starts off with a parable because Peter asks Jesus a question in verse 21. It says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft? So he's saying, How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. He's saying, Okay, you know, I know you want us to forgive people, forgive our brothers, but I mean, seriously, Lord, how many times do, should we be doing this? If someone just continually just sins against me and sins against me and sins against me, do I keep forgiving him? I mean, is it seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now, I don't believe that 490 is like the magic number, right? Obviously, it's language that's being used to just mean there is, there is no limit. Just if, if your brother continues to offend against you, you know, then just forgive him. Because we're supposed to have that type of a, a forgiving attitude or mindset like Christ had, the, the, you know, who came to die for the sins of all mankind. And, you know, when we look at ourselves... None of us in this room is perfect. We're all still sinners, right? We all still transgress against God, yet Christ continues to forgive. He's forgiven us of all of our sins. It's a lot of forgiveness that he's showing. And if we, if we look back on what we've been forgiven of, it's more than 490 times, <laughs> right? And um, so he's just saying, look, just, just you need to keep forgiving your brother. When your brother for, you know, trespasses against you, just forgive him. But that's what prompts this next parable. Because that's what closes out the chapter then, is that you know, he's asking about this forgiveness. So now he brings up this parable. Now, always be careful when you look at a parable, because this is obviously a parable. This is not like direct, clear-cut teachings. You know, when, uh, it, for example, like in Matthew 24, the disciples asked Jesus a flat-out question, you know, when, when is this stuff going to happen? Talking about the end times. When is this stuff? When, when, what are going to be the signs of your coming? And they ask him a direct question and he gives them a direct answer. There's no parable like it's, it's going to be like this. No. He says this is what it's going to be like. And when we look at our doctrine, we form our doctrine on what we believe. It ought to be coming first and foremost from the statements in the Bible that are very clear, from the statements that teach you, yeah, there's, I mean, there's no question about this. When you start looking at parables, hey, parables are great for learning. They're great tools. It's, there's a great way to help us understand things. But if all of your doctrine revolves around a parable, you, you might want to heavily consider whether or not what you believe is true, because parables are all, very oftentimes misinterpreted. They're looked at, and you start taking things in ways that it wasn't even meant to be about. And one of the ways, and we'll get to this a little uh, near the end, is when people start applying this to our salvation. And what they'll do is they'll take this la the second to last verse, verse 34, it says, And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors. And they'll say, See, it says tormentors. That must mean he's talking about hell. Right? Because what happened? People are tortured and tormented in hell. So this is referring to hell. So he's saying, well, even though he's already been forgiven, now if you don't forgive other people, then you're going to be sent to hell. And that's how they'll take this parable. Okay? But this flies in the face of all of the clear statements that say, for example, John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life, with no mention of forgiving other people, just saying, look, you have everlasting life, it lasts forever, you shall not, you've, you shall not come into condemnation, you've already passed from death unto life. That's a clear statement. That's a clear teaching. That's not a parable. Jesus is flat out saying, this is the way it is. This story, this whole story is a parable. We didn't lose, we didn't jump away from the story when he says, Hey, that, that Lord was, was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors so he should pay that was due to him. That's still part of the parable. Okay? And just because it has this word torment or tormentors that isn't necessarily commonly used today, in there, we, we, you, know, you can't just automatically assume that that's talking about hell. We need, we need to see what are the ramifications. If this is talking about hell, then what does that mean? Well, if this is talking about hell then that means that we need to be obeying God's law in order to make sure we don't go to hell. Which is in contradiction to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. 
it is the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. If we have to do extra works, that it's, in, it's in stark contradiction, so that can't be true. But, so what is this teaching then? What is this, what is this parable teaching? It's teaching that there's two types of forgiveness in this world. One forgiveness is the eternal punishment for our sins, which is the lake of fire. It is hell. That is the eternal punishment for our sins. And one sin is enough to send us to that place. Any sin against God is enough for that punishment to be meted out unto us. But the other type of forgiveness is the temporal forgiveness. It's, a, it's, it's for in this lifetime. There's a forgiveness that you can receive. See, once Jesus Christ has come, Jesus Christ paid the eternal punishment for all of our sins when he came and he died on that cross. He bare the sins of the whole world in his own body, died on the cross, his soul descended into hell, and then three days later rose again from the dead. When he did that, that covers the eternal punishment for our sin. But once you accept Christ as your Savior, once you put your faith on him, the Bible teaches us that we become born again. We become God's children. Okay, I'll turn, if you would, to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. We become God's children. And as a child of God now, we are no longer have to worry about facing the eternal punishment. We don't have to worry about God kicking us out of the family and, and burning us in a, in a fiery furnace. The same way that my children don't have to worry about no matter what they do wrong, their punishment is never going to be, I'm going to open up the oven, you know, put it on broil, and lock it and leave them in there forever. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? There's, there's absolutely no way I'll ever do that. Why? Because I love them. If they break every single rule, if they're the most rebellious children in the whole world against me, I'm still going to love them. Which is why I would never give them that type of a punishment. The torture and torment associated with that. But, just because they're my children and just because they won't have that punishment doesn't mean they get zero punishment and doesn't mean you know, nothing is going to happen and there's no consequences whatsoever for their actions. So there is a level of forgiveness. that They don't need that forgiveness of the eternal sense. I mean, I'm not God, right? But as children of God, we have already received the eternal forgiveness. But there comes a time when we transgress and we sin because we're still sinners, because we're not, we're not just completely perfect after salvation. We still live in this flesh and we still continue to do things that are sinful where we want to ask God for it to have mercy on us. We know we've done wrong. We know we deserve a punishment for what we've done in this lifetime, but where we can go to God and still ask for more forgiveness, for forgiveness for what might happen to us in this lifetime. You see, as a child of God and as any loving father would, God disciplines us when we sin. But see, there's a different purpose. The, 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 the punishment that you receive when a person goes to hell, that's an eternal punishment that they're reaping what they've sown, where, where, where they've sinned against God. They did not receive the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. They are going to be tortured and tormented forever. But that is not, the goal of that punishment is not to make them a better person. That's just a punishment that's being, being handed out for what they've done wrong. The discipline that a father gives is designed to make a change in you, to make you do better. Say, okay, like with my children, they, they, they break whatever rule and they get a spanking, right? It hurts. They cry. They don't like it. But the, the goal that it was designed to do is to change their behavior. It's not because I just want to inflict pain on them. It's because I want them to remember in the future, no, this is the way that you need to do things. And it brings that type of a correction. And that is what God does with all of his children. He, he corrects us when we do wrong. Look at Hebrews 12, verse number 5. The Bible reads, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. Chastening just means disciplining. The chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Look at that, every son. Everybody that God receives gets scourged. And a scourge is a whipping, is what that is. 
It's exactly what that is. It's a, it's a whooping from God. When you do wrong, because we all sin and because He loves us as His children, He chastens us. He scourges us because we need it. We need correction. But He's saying, don't faint. Don't, don't, don't let that get you out and get a bad attitude when God disciplines you. Because it's going to happen. God needs to correct us. So when God corrects you, don't have this poor attitude of saying, oh, I don't have anything to do with God. No, you going to discipline, you know. That's the wrong way to do it. It says in verse 8, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Oops, I'm sorry, I missed verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Basically, again, saying, you know, God's going to discipline you. Otherwise, you're not even a son. You have, to, you have to ask yourself that question. If you could just sin and get away with it, and there's just seems to be no consequences for your actions, I mean, that would, to me, it'd be like, after reading these verses, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You have to say, am I even a child of God? That's why people can, you can look at the, the popular people today, right? The, the movie stars, actors, actresses, you know, rock stars or whatever. People that live these really wicked lives. Because oftentimes you can do this. You can look at someone and be like, well, wait a minute. How is it that this person has all this money, they have all this wealth, they party, they do all these drugs, they have all these different women, they're committing adultery, you know, they're doing all, living this life of wickedness. Yet everybody loves them and nothing ever seems to happen to them. And they just can continue and continue to make even more money and continue to be loved by the world. How is that possible? Well, because they're, they're bastards, they're not sons. God's not correcting them. God's not trying to discipline them. They're not even a child of God. And the reason is they could, they could live it up because ultimately there's going to be a price to pay for that. They're not going to receive it now in this lifetime, but, it, but there is a punishment to come. But if, if, if someone were to get saved, obviously, then they become a child of God. Then they're no longer a bastard. They're a child of God. And then God will start to deal with them as children as sons, as daughters. He will deal with you in that way. Verse 9 says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. So he's saying, you know, God does it for our benefit. It's for our profit. That's why he chastens us. That we may be partakers of his holiness. His holiness is his, is his righteousness. He's set apart and he's holy and perfect without sin. He wants us to be like that. So he'll discipline us to try to, to, try to get all the sin out of our lives to help us that, that we can be closer to him and we can be more godly ourselves. It's a common theme throughout the Bible. Uh, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. But in Galatians 6, the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. It's a common theme, and, and you could see this visibly in life. You know, we reap what we sow. The things that we, if we decide to go out and sin and do, and do just a bunch of wicked things, bad things, hey, it's going to bring wicked and evil and bad things back onto us. And it gets multiplied. When you sow a seed, it's just a little thing. When it grows up and brings out fruit, you know, like our apple trees, when those things become fully mature, I mean, that's going to be bringing forth hundreds of apples. So that little seed that you sow, and that's what he's teaching us here in Galatians 6, you know, look, when you sow something, when you're doing wicked, when you start doing bad, that's going to come back and bite you way worse than even that little bit that you were doing. It's going to come back. But on the same token, it works the same way for the good that you do. So when you start doing good works and you're sowing good seed, then that's also going to come back. In, in, in a multi-fold fashion where, where it comes back um, way more than what you put in. So it's just a warning, right? Be careful with what you're doing and how you're living, the things that you decide to do and the seeds that you're sowing. So <clears throat> in this lifetime, the way, if you, once you're already saved, in this lifetime, the way that we behave ourselves is going to come back to, our, to us. But once you br breathe your last breath, the wickedness that you've done, that's not going to come back to you anymore because 
there's no longer a need for the correction, right? When, when, the, when this fleshly body is passed and is buried in the ground, all that's left is our soul and spirit. We do not have the same sinful nature driving us to sin. Because you're born again, you have a new spirit that's born inside of you that, that 1 John chapter 3 teaches cannot sin. That new creature that you have, and this is the battle between the spirit and the flesh that we battle daily. The Apostle Paul writes a lot about, you know, we have to die to self daily. We have this spirit that wants to do right and the flesh that drives bad. And when the flesh is, is passed on, when, the, when we're separated from our flesh, there's no reason, there's, there's, we will not sin. Because we don't have the flesh. The flesh isn't driving us. All that we're left with is the soul and spirit. And the soul and spirit are not, are not prone to sin. They're not bound to make us sin. So, and then eventually we're going to get new bodies, right? And they're going to be completely perfect and not sinful at all. But <clears throat> once that's gone, there's no need for correction. Look at Matthew 7, verse number 1. Bible reads, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And this falls in line. It's the same type of thinking. It's the same type of mindset of reaping what you sow. Okay, he's saying, and, and people like to stop at the first two words of, of verse number one and just say, judge not. That's not what this chapter is teaching, okay? This isn't saying just never judge anything ever. We can't judge at all because, no. Judge not that ye be not judged. The purpose, what he's, it's a warning, again, saying be careful how you are judging because the way that you judge other people is the way that you yourself will be judged. And he goes on, we'll read it. He says, um, Verse 3, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So he's saying, you know, he gives an example here of someone He's got this big old beam coming out of his eye and he's trying to help his brother. It's just a little speck, just a, just a little mold, a little, a little piece of dust in his eye, right? Now, both of these are problems. So you get a little speck in your eye, can, can be a big problem for you, right? But the bigger one is having, you know, you have like a big arrow or something like sticking out of your eye. Someone shot you with an arrow. And the person who's got this major problem with their vision is not going to be able to help the person who has the minor problem until they're able to fix this problem first, then they can see clearly. So what he's saying is, you know, if you've got this, this major sin in your life, don't be going to someone else and judging them and trying to help them with some minor sin that they have, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're living in fornication, yet you're going to give someone else, you're going to rebuke someone else for watching a TV program or something, right? Like, like that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here, saying don't be a hypocrite, don't, don't be this person who's, you know, you're going to judge someone else for something minor that's going on. Now, both of them need to be corrected and ought to be corrected. They're both problems, but the way that you judge other people is going to come back to you. And especially, you know, if you're, don't be a hypocrite about it either. He's saying, you know, if you're, if you're someone committing adultery on your wife, don't be, don't be telling someone else they shouldn't be living in fornication. I mean, you're basically, you're just a complete hypocrite at that point. Like, how are you any better? How, where do you have room to stand to, to judge someone else in that matter? But it's not saying don't ever judge. So there are certain things that you can judge on if you're completely fine in that area and you're, and you're doing overall pretty well. Now, look, I know we're all sinners, but... When, when you've got a, a certain area of your life and you say you've never done drugs, you want to help someone else out who's doing drugs, you're not being a hypocrite by, by you know, judging them and saying, hey, look, man, this is, this is bad for you. You need to stop this. This isn't good for you because your eye is clear. You can help that person to get, over, to get through that problem and, and if it needs rebuking or whatever it needs to, to help them to get that, uh, that moat out of their eye or as, as the case may be. 
But um, let's keep reading here. He says in verse 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? And, he, and he, we finish off here with this passage with another reference to being a child of God. And, and he's relating it to, look, if your son comes to you and asks you for something good, are you just going to give him a snake? Like, are you just going to give him something that's going to hurt him? You know, are you, are you going to just give him a stone? Like, oh, Dad, I'm hungry. Here's a stone. Of course you're not going to do that. Of course not. So he's saying, you know, God's your heavenly father. How do you think he's going to treat you? Now, this is in, in response to prayer, but the, the, the bigger thing is, you know, what we're dealing with more this morning is the forgiveness. So let me put it this way. If my child breaks one of my rules, if I say, you know, no, it's too late. I want you to go brush your teeth and get ready for bed. You can't go out and jump on the trampoline, right? Because, I mean, my kids are real little. So it's not, like, it's not like their sins are real grievous sins that they're committing against me. But, uh, you know, if an, an act of rebellion was still a sin and it's going to be dealt with appropriately. But let's say they, they say, you know what? Forget that. I know what Dad said. I'm just going to go out and jump on the trampoline anyways because I want to do it, right? Now... They go out and do that, and they just have this, this real bad attitude, and I catch them, and they're like, well, I wanted to go do it. They're going to receive a significant punishment, right? Because that's, that's, they're going to they're gonna get that, that rebellion driven from them. But what if they do the same exact thing? They go out, they jump on trampoline, but then they come in, they, they start to feel bad about it when they're out there. And they say, you know what? I shouldn't be doing this. I should listen to Dad. And they come in and say, Dad... I, I disobeyed you. I know what you told me to do. It was wrong. I'm sorry. I'll try not to do that again. You think there might be a little bit different response then from me? Absolutely. Because again, what's the purpose of the disciplining? It's for the correction. If I can see that the, the correction is already taking place, I'm going to extend mercy. And she says, you know, forgive me. I know I've done wrong. Forgive me. I'm going to look at that seriously and say, okay, I, I will show forgiveness then. This is the, the relationship between the father and the child that what we've been reading about and forgiving others. See, God wants to see us have that attitude towards others because he's so forgiving towards us. But it makes him angry when... He forgives us for so much, but then we can't l let other people you know, transgress against us and we, we are bitter and we hold them to every last thing when he's already done so much for us. It makes him angry. So in this lifetime, he's not going to extend that mercy and that forgiveness to us because we have such a poor attitude towards others and we're disobeying and disregarding the way that he's commanded us to live. And that's essential. I mean, this is what really wraps up what the, the two different types of forgiveness is. So when we look at this stuff, you can try not to let someone you know, twist your head around with showing these verses, because we write them. I mean, that's, that's pretty much most of them. You might be able to find one or two others that are similar, that are talking about you know, not receiving forgiveness. But that's what the forgiveness is. It's, it's when you're already saved, you don't need the eternal punishment forgiven. Christ took care of that. But, but the correction part, yeah, we do need to worry about that. Turn, if you would, to Ezekiel 18. Because this, this all ties in together, and I wanted to get into this last Sunday night. Last Sunday, I, pre I, I preached two sermons on repentance and salvation. And the repentance that's required to be saved versus this false repentance for salvation that says you have to turn from all of your sins to be saved. I proved last week that that is a works-based salvation to turn from all of your sins. If you turn from all of your sins, then that means you're not going to do them anymore. If you truly turn, if you truly repent, you don't do it anymore. So if you have to just stop sinning and obey the law, 
That's not salvation. That's a works-based salvation. That's a law-based salvation. But I'm not going to re preach the whole sermon. But I wanted to get into this. See, what I did last week was covered all of the New Testament references to the word repent in any form. Repent, repenting, repentance, any form of repent in the New Testament because we're dealing with just salvation and went through every single verse to see how does that apply. In some cases it does refer, it is appropriate to say it's talking about salvation, but in others it's not. So it went through every single reference. It was real exhaustive. I wanted to get to this because Ezekiel 18, and this ties in with, with the message this morning about forgiveness. It's a similar type of thing. It's a similar concept of being forgiven by God in this lifetime, but has nothing to do with our eternal salvation. Ezekiel 18 is a, is a chapter that talks a lot about turning from your sins and repenting of your, of your wicked ways and repenting of your sins. But we're going to see in context here what this is talking about. Let's look, start reading in verse number... Um, well, let me turn there real quick. I have 21, but I think I'm going to want to go a little bit up just to get the full context. So, yeah, Jeremiah. Ezekiel 18. Look at verse 19. Oh, let's, no, let's jump up a little bit more. You know what? We've got time. We're going to read, we're going to read the whole chapter. Because you get the whole thing in kind Because the whole thing talks about it. The, the part that I wanted to focus on is just, is more right in the middle. But the whole thing gives it in context. It talks about, you know, if you have a man and he's, he's doing wickedness and stuff, he's going to be judged for his wickedness, and he has a son, and his son does what's right, and, and how the son's not going to be judged for the sins of his father. You know, everyone's judged on their own character, on the things that they do. But let's, well, let's read this whole thing. We've, we've got enough time. We're, we're, I'm doing pretty good with time. Look at verse number one. The, 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 way of, or excuse me, the word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye? that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the father, so also the soul of the son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord God. Now I want to pause here. As we're reading this, pay attention because he's going to use the words, he's going to live or he's going to die. He shall surely die. He shall surely live. What I want to mention is that, first of all, there's no mention of eternal life or hell in the context. And you see it for yourself in this whole chapter. Okay? And what I want to point out is that we need to, ma we need to make sure very clear, if we're going to turn to a, a passage and say this is talking about salvation, what indication is giving you that? Uh, and hopefully it's not just someone has taught me this and someone just said that this is the way it is. Where you can look at a passage and say, well, what are the clues that will indicate this is talking about eternal life, that this is talking about my soul being saved from going to hell? As opposed to, because God does bring punishment and recompense upon our sins in this lifetime as opposed to me just actually dying. Okay, If we sin enough, God can take our life from us in this life, but it doesn't mean He's sending us to hell. Once you've already been born again, you are His child. He can cut short your, your work on earth here because he's, he's angry with what you're doing and to cause other people to fear. And we saw this in the book of Acts. 
with Ananias and Sapphira. Now, I personally believe they're saved, and I don't want to get too far into this. Ananias and Sapphira were the couple that they sold a property, and they brought money and laid it at the apostles' feet, but they didn't bring all of the money. They kept back some for themselves. Now, it was their own property. They could have done anything they wanted with it. They weren't required to do this. But what they did was they said, yep, this is all of it. And they lied and they made it look like they were giving everything when they didn't really do that. So they were struck dead. Their, God took their life. I mean, it's not like Peter took a knife and killed them or something. They just, they fell down dead. Now, I believe that they were saved, but God was showing an example, saying, look, don't lie to the Holy Ghost. Don't do this. This is, this is serious sin. And their life, they gave up the ghost. Both of them. And I think that that will still happen to Christians today. If you're not doing... Look, the reason why we're here is because God has a purpose for you. Every single one of you, God has something for you to do. God has work for you to do. And He wants you to do it. But if you just completely reject that work and just... And just not doing anything for the Lord, what, what, what is your purpose for being here anymore? You're already saved. You're a child, but you're just not doing anything. I believe it'll just, just end that short. But So, he mentions now, we've read up to verse 9, and he goes over all of the, like, like a summary of the law. Everything he's mentioned is just obeying God's law. Right? Now, if a man completely obeys God's law, just 100%, are they going to go to heaven? Sure. Jesus Christ, right, was the only one that can do that. Now, is anybody capable of keeping the whole law all the time and not sinning in one point? No, of course not. So again, there's a first indicator saying, okay, well, is this even talking about our eternal salvation? When he just says, okay, you've got to keep all of the law. All of the law, and you're going to live. Let's keep reading, verse number 10. Because that's not exactly the point. Like, I don't believe that's the point of this chapter is our eternal salvation. He's teaching something else. He's talking about everyone being responsible for their own actions and his judgment that does come upon sin, but that's, I don't think this is talking about our eternal salvation. Let's keep reading. Verse number 10. But this is the chapter that people like to turn to to try to prove that we do need to repent of our sins in order to be saved eternally, in order for our souls to be saved from hell. Verse number 10. If he beget a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that doeth the like to any one of these things... And that doeth not any of those duties, but even hath eaten upon the mountains, and defiled his neighbor's wife, hath oppressed the poor and needy, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, and hath lifted up his eyes to the idols, hath committed abomination, hath given forth upon usury, and hath taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Now, lo, if he beget a son that seeth all his father's sins which he hath done and considereth and doeth not such like that hath not eaten upon the mountains neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel hath not defiled his neighbor's wife neither hath oppressed any hath not withholden the pledge neither hath spoiled by violence but hath given his bread to the hungry and hath covered the naked with a garment that hath taken off his hand from the poor that hath not received usury nor increase hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes, he shall not die. For the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. Yet say ye, why? Doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins, this is, this is what they like to turn to. Verse 21. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness 
and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live. All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Now, I want to stop here for a minute. If this is talking about our eternal salvation, what is this saying? This is saying that if someone's done all kinds of wickedness and all kinds of sin, if they just start doing right and follow all the law, then there's, you know, and this is in the context of people who want to use this for salvation, right? Then they'll say, well, they're saved. And then it says, well, if there's someone who's righteous and doesn't commit sin and then they start to commit sin, then they're going to go to hell. According to this mindset, right? I'm not saying that this is what this is about. Do you see any mention of faith or belief or anything in this chapter at all? No. It's not that we're, we'll read the rest of the chapter just so you can see that. This has nothing to do with our souls being saved. This has to do with the way we live our life. Look, if you're righteous, if you're, if you're doing what's right right now, if you're saved and you're doing what's right, if you decide to just turn from, from a righteous way of living and start living in wickedness and living in sin, hey, that's going to bring death upon you because sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's what happens. Not just eternal death, but, but even just in this lifetime. If I started to live a life of, of fornication or adultery and, and, and drunkenness and drugs, everything, that's going to kill me. I mean, even inherently in sin are consequences. There's disease, there's, you know, there's pro health problems, all kinds of things associated when you start living a wicked life that will just bring death on you anyways. But let's keep reading here. Because we have to understand the ramification when someone wants to show you. See, this says you have to turn from all of your wicked ways. And you'll live. Well, you're, you're making a stretch right there by saying live means you'll have eternal life. As opposed to just living here. And, and, and preserving your, your physical life. Let's keep reading. But when the righteous turn away from his righteousness, verse 24, and commit iniquity, I think we read this already, I'll keep reading. And doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live. All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, not my ways equal, are not your ways unequal. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. And if you live a life of iniquity, it will be your ruin. It doesn't mean you're going to go to hell, but that will ruin your entire life. It'll bring you to nothing. Verse 31, Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel, for I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. Now, this ties in exactly with what happened with Jonah and Nineveh. Right? What did they have to do? They were living, the whole city was given over to, to just living wickedness, to doing wickedness. And God was going to destroy the city. Physically. Now, that didn't have anything to do with, with the individual soul being saved. God was going to bring judgment upon an entire city because they were doing wickedly. And this, this happens all throughout the Bible, all throughout history, when, a, when an entire nation, a group, a group of people, a city, a nation starts doing wickedly. Overall, just the overall wickedness of the city is great. God brings judgment. God will bring an army against them. God will bring some kind of natural, he'll bring something to, to lay them low. And, and to destroy them and to bring his judgment upon them. But when, they, but when the city is doing what's right 
Or if they turn from that, from that wickedness and do what's right, God will spare their, their, their nation or their city and let them live. That's like, that's the salvation of a nation, of a big group of people is based on their works. But the individual soul, whether or not a person goes to heaven or hell, is not based on our works. It's based on a free gift. And that's why I wanted to bring that up because this is, this is a very important chapter when dealing with repentance. So this is kind of the third part for, for last week's two-part series. But um, it ties in perfectly with the two types of forgiveness because it's the same exact concept. The concept is there in the Bible that there's, there's a, the way that we live our life here and the ramifications for what we do here versus in the eternal sense. I firmly believe we need to repent of our sins. I'm going to preach on that, but it's not going to determine whether or not we go to heaven or hell. It's for this lifetime, repenting of our sins and doing what's right in God's eyes and earning rewards in heaven. There's so many reasons to, to get the sin out of our life, and I think we absolutely should. I'll preach hard against it. But do not let that taint the free gift. Because us repenting of our sins is works. That's hard work to, to, to always choose the right way and to not do what's wrong and to not do what's bad and to do what's right. That is work. And that's why I brought up also that reference to Jonah. Jonah 3.10 says, And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. Because it was works. They started doing that which was right. Now God was pleased with that and he spared that city, but as, he didn't say, okay, now because the city is doing that's right, everyone's going to heaven. No. That's an individual matter whether or not you receive that free gift. And that's all it's based on. So if someone wants to bring you to Ezekiel 18 to try to teach you that this is a part of our eternal salvation, start asking, well, where does this talk about belief? Where does this talk about faith? Because it doesn't. Where does this talk about eternal life? It doesn't. It's not mentioned. In the, we read the whole chapter. I didn't see it one time. Now it absolutely says, hey, do what's right and you'll live. Sure. We should be doing what's right so we can live so that we don't have to worry about God getting so angry with us that, that he ends up just, just saying, okay, well, I'm done with you now. And just take our life. Last place we'll turn, Psalm 51. I'm going to close with this. Because we'll see, even with, uh, with David, these are both Old Testament reference, Ezekiel 18 and Psalm 51. Now, your, your Bible may or may not have the little, the little subtitles underneath the psalm, but in Psalm 51, the little subtitle reads, reads to the chief musician, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. When he commit adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband, Uriah, killed, he commit murder and adultery. Two very, very, very bad sins. I mean, these are grievous sins that bear the death penalty, both of them. Now, if Ezekiel 18 is true, then he should have lost his salvation. But he didn't lose his salvation, and this is evident. That's why I want to read. See, David had a rep he did have a repentant heart, but even that repentant heart didn't give him his salvation back. But it did cause God to extend mercy on him that he didn't lose his life for doing those sins that he committed because he showed that repentance. Now, he did suffer consequences for that sin, and that's evident throughout the Bible. You see, first of all, the child that was born as a result of that adultery was, was taken away. He was, he was killed. We also see problems with David's other sons and, and more problems with his family that were all attributed unto his sin that he did. He had his son um, Amnon that, that tried to uh, basically take the kingdom from him and that, that <clears throat> had relations with his concubines. And, and did, there's lots of things that happen as a result of David's sin. He did receive a recompense and a punishment, but because of his repentant heart, God did extend mercy to him. He didn't take his life as would have been just. God showed mercy upon him. Look at verse number 1. We'll read this Psalm 51 and we'll, and we'll be done. Have mercy upon me, O God, 
according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, Thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now I want to point out, when he says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, this is, in the Old Testament, this is prior to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we have in the New Testament. That was something that was new, that was given after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit inside of their bodies. We, like inside of us now, and this was prophesied in the Old Testament where God's going to write his laws in our hearts. And we have the Holy Spirit to guide us and to teach us. In the Old Testament, all they had was this Holy Spirit coming upon people. When the Holy Spirit would come upon you, you'd get power. You know, the Holy Spirit came upon Samson and gave him all this strength to do, to do these great things for God. The Holy Spirit would come upon different men in the Bible that would give them this power and this strength, but it wasn't indwelling inside of them. In the New Testament, there's both. The, 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 the Holy Spirit coming on you and giving you power has not gone away. That's still there. But we now have it indwelling. So when he says this, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Well, the Spirit was taken away from Saul, if you remember, and were given unto David. But it's not the salvation. It's not the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's, the, that's God's power resting upon you through his Holy Spirit. But in, in, this is evident in verse 12. He says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He didn't say restore unto me thy salvation. He said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. See, you're not very happy when you, you know, when, when, you, especially when you commit these grievous sins. He is very sorrowful and sad. And yeah, he knows he has eternal life, but it's not like he's even very happy about it because he's done so much wrong and so much wickedness. He's grieving and mournful. He's saying, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto me. See, he knows that this sin ruined his testimony too. He's saying, look, you know, clean my heart, clean me up. God, help me out here. I'm sorry. I recognize I've done what's wrong. Just, just renew me, refresh me, you know, give me a fresh start. I, I, I want to start over. And restore unto me that joy of the salvation, that I'm mindful of that, and then I can go out and teach others. And then I could go finally go out again and, and show other people and give sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. Verse 14, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of, my, of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion, build thou the walls of Jerusalem, then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering, then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. David's getting right with God in this psalm is what he's trying to do. He's expressing his sorrow, his grief, his, his repentance, his, you know, that, that he wants to do what's right, and he's going to God after having already done you know, bad things and broken God's laws. As God's child, he's asking for some sort of mercy and some sort of forgiveness. And he's not worried about his eternal salvation. That's why he says, restore the joy of, my, of thy salvation. Not, not, I need to be saved again. Just, just make me happy about this again. Make, you know, give me the joy so that I can work and serve you again and go out and convert people to you. Because when you sin, let's face it, you know, we are vessels that God has made to do His work and to do His will. And that's why we need to be making ourselves the, the most, the, a vessel that's, that could be most utilized by God. 
that, that we're, we're ready, that we become a better instrument to be used by God by getting the sins out of our life. But when, you know, we're not going to be very useful when we're continuing to do sin. It's just, it's just not going to happen. We're going to be more like hypocrites. Our testimony gets shattered. People say, and, and I've had this happen personally, when I've had problems after I got saved, but I still continued living, you know, drinking, doing drugs, and doing all this other stuff, right? And living his life. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even open up my mouth to people about Christ because I just felt like this big hypocrite. I didn't have the joy of, of God's salvation when I was living that type of a life after I was saved. It wasn't there because I was a total hypocrite and I would even start to question myself and say, why am I doing these things if I believe that this is true? I needed to get right with God. And I, and I had a similar prayer that David did when, when I finally was trying to just do what's right. and said, God, I'm done with this. I'm sick of this. I want to do what's right. You know, show mercy on me and, and clean, you know, give me a new heart. Clean my heart. You know, help me to, to, to get all this stuff, to repent of my sins. Get them out of here. Get out of this stuff and, and start to do what's right for you. It's a place that we all should get, should get to whenever we, you know, when we do get, get caught up in sin. We should always be repenting of our sins, but that's not part of our salvation. It's, it's what we do to avoid God's punishment in this lifetime. And those are the two types of forgiveness that we could find in the Bible. It's the eternal forgiveness, which Christ has already taken care of, versus God's punishment as His children. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You so much for your words. We thank you for your instruction, dear God. We thank you for the free gift of salvation, that it's not based on how good we are in order to keep it, in order to receive it, dear Lord, but that you just give it to us out of love. It's already been bought and paid for. All we have to do is receive it. God, we thank you for the freeness of that gift. But we pray also that you would help us to get the sin out of our life, to repent of our sins daily, dear Lord that we can serve you better and that we, we don't get distracted and caught up with the cares of this world, but that we can have a good testimony before others and that you would help us to convert souls unto you, dear Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.